poem that she wrote and that she shared with me. So thank you, Danielle. Um, I'm going to start, start us off with this poem. Montana, August. Dust tracks you and settles like a house guest. Montana, August, and the earth cracks crow's feet across burning plains. A tinderbox fighting one hot breath. Montana does not need you, never did. Prehistoric in its indifference. Peaks rise against a royal sky and sit heavy on a bladed stage. A lucky traveler wanders. A mindful traveler aches. A corridor named for bitterroot laceration in the big wide open. Water cuts a rusted trail. Maybe you catch the clouds in a rose-soaked flush. Maybe you grasp the rise of a glowing loam. But this assumes you're paying mind. So thank you very much, Danielle, for letting me share that. Um, if you feel called to do so, uh, feel free to, in the chat, submit a word or a phrase that comes to mind upon hearing um, this poem, just to get your creative juices flowing. Does it, uh, just a quick question, do you see the words hide thumbnail video on your screens or is that just for me? Okay, there we go. No, I don't see that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so place and positionality, the context of my work. Um, so I believe that geographic diversity is a facet of identity that's worth treating with complexity. It's something worth considering alongside race and gender and class and ability. Um, and so just a small example of how geographic diversity shows up in these slides. Um, in the photos, you'll see I often will write underneath Sheridan County, Montana, instead of Dagmar, Montana, my home because that's really more encompassing of my rural home place since um, Dagmar, which is linked to our mailing address is actually over 10 miles away. Um, and that's a picture of my dad from the seventies. These are also pictures of my dad and I, and that's my grandmother, um, Abby. So Krista Tippett, who hosts the podcast On Being, which is one of my favorite podcasts, um, she asks the people that she interviews about the religious or spiritual background of their childhood. And I really like to ask people about their geographic background, which can encompass religion and spirituality, but it also opens up discussions about landscape and wildlife and weather, industry, family history and migration, culture, class and access. Um, and that's often something we ask people about, right? Like, where are you from? But I sometimes find that geography is kind of um, missing in that larger discussion of identity differences. So in addition to my hope that reframing rural helps to bridge the urban rural divide, it's also a space for rural, rural raised listeners to see themselves reflected. Um, and so I believe no matter where you were raised that we car carry the corporeal knowledge of a place with us. It's like in the very fabric of our being, even if we're not thinking about it, it's kind of playing in the background. Um, and I, I love this concept um, from Ghana called Sankofa. I think about that a lot and it's symbolized by a bird that is rooted in the present and it's taking what it has learned from the past and it's carrying it forward into the future. Um, a saying that I kind of think about along with that is don't get too big for your britches. Um, don't forget about where you come from. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about the places that I've lived in. Um, Peter listed some of those places off for you. So I've lived in Alaska briefly, North Carolina, North Dakota, Oregon, Germany, the Czech Republic, and Seattle, Missoula, Montana and Dagmar, the place of my childhood. So the census and the USDA have their definitions of um, rural based on population. And I'll mention that Sheridan County, Montana, where Dagmar is located, has 3,400 residents. I think it's about two people per square mile. Um, Dagmar is about 30 people in the town. The town I went to school in Medicine Lake, Montana, um, has 300 people. And then the two closest cities are three hours away each, and that's Regina, Saskatchewan, population 229,000, and Minot, North Dakota, population 47,000. But I think of rural in terms of the granularity of place, in terms of its human and geologic history, and all its beautiful and unique complexity. So I feel like I kind of prefer the qualitative understanding of rural rather than the numbers, because um, I think there's more meaning that can be found there. 
Um, so Seattle's obviously where I live. And then um, I've this year, for example, I've spent uh, four months in Missoula, a month in Dagmar. And um, because of the context of COVID, I really found myself going home and um, regrouping and just laying low. Um, and that experience was kind of disorienting going from urban Seattle to rural adjacent Missoula to extremely remote Sheridan County. Um, when I drove back to Seattle, the streets felt very narrow and the cars were really small and people I feel like are a little less outwardly friendly sometimes. Um, and then in the rural places, while they're not politically homogenous, um, I didn't agree with everybody's politics or approach to COVID. Um, but I think whether you're in Dagmar or Seattle, um, on the whole, there's a problem with people not understanding each other. And what I think is even worse is when people don't even want to try to understand each other. Um, so I reflect on this in the latest episode, but sometimes I feel like I don't belong in either Seattle or Dagmar. And sometimes I feel like I've, I've been moving a lot in the last, for, I don't know, over 10 years. But Missoula is probably where I feel like I belong the most because it's kind of this blend of urban and rural. Okay, so considering place and migration and also to counter the harmful cultural erase, erasure practices of assimilation and Americanization, I want to mention the, um, the home of my ancestors. So my last name is Torgerson and my dad's family, um, their name was Drevdal before they migrated from Norway in the late 1800s and ultimately ended up in Montana. And there are several reasons for the Scandinavian migration at the turn of the 20th century. Um, primogeniture is one, which means the oldest son in, a, in the family would be the only one to inherit uh, land. So if you were younger sons, you wouldn't have that, um, that land to have a farm on. And then at this time, farming machinery was becoming more widely used in Norway. And so with the industrialization of agriculture, um, there were less people that were required to farm as well as an economic depression uh, led a lot of people to move to Minnesota, North Dakota, Montana. Um, and then my mother's parents, my grandparents were from Germany and um, Czechoslovakia, and they immigrated to Montreal, Quebec, where my mom was raised after World War II. So I'm simultaneously a fifth generation Montanan and a first generation American. And then back to my home place, um, I grew up on the ancestral land of the Assiniboine people. And I first learned of the indigenous peoples from the land. So there are teepee rings in my favorite cattle pasture near my house where I grew up um, that I would always play around and was fascinated by. But it wasn't really until grad school that I sought out and realized um, the importance of this history and the lasting effects of the genocide of indigenous peoples. And I talk about this history in episode three, but um, the reason the reservation nearing my family farm, Fort Peck, is Sioux and Assiniboine is because the Sioux got pushed further west due to Western expansion and manifest destiny. Um, they were actually originally warring tribes, but they banded under Sitting Bull during the Indian Wars. And then there's also um, Turtle Mountain Chippewa. Tr tribal members have a presence in that area as well. Um, because the Turtle Mountain Reservation in North Central North Dakota is very small, so they were allotted sections of land further west. So I want to share this resource with you if you haven't heard of it before. It's called native-land.ca, and as you can see by this beautiful colorful map, it's um, all the migration patterns of all of the different Aboriginal um, tribes that lived in North America and they have this for the whole world. It's really, really cool to like, you can type in your address and see who, who lived there. And then, um, so yeah, I just wanted to, to invite you, if you would like to share the information, this, some of this information that I have listed here, um, I invite you to, um, to share with us your, your present home, your home place, and the home of your ancestors in the chat, if, if you'd like. I'd just be curious to see um, kind of some of the geographic background of all of your, um, all of your backgrounds. So I, I live on the Duwamish and Coast Salish land of Seattle, Washington, raised on Assiniboine land, and then my ancestors are from 
Nerting in Germany, Nitriansky, Pravno, Czechoslovakia, Gaupni, Norway, and Sevi, Denmark. So feel free to share if you'd like, um, no pressure. I'm gonna just check the chat, I'm curious to see. All Tri-Cities, right on. Okay, so now I'm got kind of, that's the context and now I'm gonna move into the why. So why I started reframing rural. Um, the 2016 election was a real spark. I was seeing that the narrative on rural America was very overly politicized and demonizing and hum presenting homogenous stories that pegged rural America as Trump country. And that didn't fit my understanding. Um, and even before then, once I left the Mondak area of my childhood, which is um, means Montana, North Dakota kind of area, um, I realized that there was a great gap in knowledge that people didn't know. So they didn't know a lot about rural America, about how food is grown, about the way of life in, in remote communities. And I even found in Missoula, like there were, there were people who are maybe from larger towns in Montana that, that didn't really have that understanding. Um, so during that time in college, I, because I also had a kind of a more North Dakota accent at that time, um, I was, you know, kind of called a, a country bumpkin and people poked fun at me a little bit. And um, I didn't want to come off like I lacked intelligence. So I changed my accent and I kind of distanced myself from my Great Plains past. So um, the word reframing, in grad school, I encountered um, professor of Maori and indigenous studies, Linda Tuivai Smith. Um, and she wrote in her book, Decolonizing Methodologies about these 25 indigenous projects of which reframing is one. And um, so I understand reframing is taking back control of the way issues are discussed by bringing into focus details that are lost when people are boxed into labels by society. So there's lots of ways to reframe. Um, you can, of course, reframe in a way that shows that um, a rural way of life is not a monolith, that arts and culture doesn't have to be metrocentric, that it can exist beyond the city, um, that rural America is racially diverse, politically diverse, religiously diverse. Um, so many different ways to reframe. But um, within season one, uh, the first season of Reframing Rural, which I've called Coming Home, it's, um, and what we'll be talking about for the rest of the time today really is, um, it's centered on reframing my home region of the Northern Great Plains of Montana. So um, I, while I, I, I'm excited to, in future research, kind of expand on how I'm reframing, that's the context for, for this first part of the project. And then another one of the indigenous projects, there's so many that I relate to and that have inspired me, but um, remembering is another one that I really resonate with. And I'm just gonna read a quote from Decolonizing Methodologies. So the remembering of a people relates not so much to an idealized remembering of a golden past, but more specifically to the remembering of a painful past. Remembering in terms of connecting bodies with place and experience and importantly, people's response to that pain. So it's not, in, in my context of my home place, it's not glorifying the pioneer past, but it's remembering with respect and honesty. So reframing, reframing rural, as we've mentioned, um, addresses the urban rural conflict. Um, so now I've come to understand the source of the stereotyping that I experienced in college and beyond was due to single stories of rural America um, that really lean into the stereotype and focus um, on how, or how rural America lacks in comparison to its urban counterpart. So um, reframing rural count is, tries to counter that scarcity-based lens with stories that highlight the abundance of rural communities. So my efforts are trying to offer a more, more complex portrayals of rurality that I find are often um, characterize or missing within pop culture in the media. And so Tui Wai Smith also experienced this and to bring back her perspective, she wrote, um, much of what I have read has said that we do not exist, that if we do exist, it is in terms which I cannot recognize, that we are no good and that what we think is not valid. So for me, this shows up through 
reading headlines that read middle of nowhere or flyover country, um, for example. So these terms are kind of um, exacerbated by extractive journalism practices where journalism uh, journalists from major metropolitan areas kind of parachute into a rural community. Um, and they coin people's homes using these negligent adjectives. Um, and I think about like middle of nowhere that kind of elicits that you are nobody. And what does that do to these individual people's mental health? So I used to say that I'm from the middle of nowhere because I got sick of um, describing a place that nobody could really understand where it was. Um, but I don't use that language anymore. And I, um, I urge you to, to also not use that, that language. And I think a great alternative is the heartland because I just, I don't know, it has heart and land. It's, it's a nice, a nice coupling of words. So I wanted to share a, just a couple of resources with you in the chat. Um, so one is called Revealing Rural Realities. It's some research done by the Aspen Institute about what fuels inaccurate and incomplete coverage of rural areas. The next link is, um, it's called the View From Somewhere podcast, and it talks about extractive journalism and the, the importance of diversity in newsrooms. Um, and then there's this awesome documentary called Hillbilly that addresses the problems of rural stereotypes in film and culture. And then my favorite book written by Sarah Marsh called Heartland, a memoir of working hard and being broke in the richest country on earth. So I'm just gonna share those links with you if you ever want to look it up. Oh, cool. My grandparents are from Missoula and great grandparents from Czechoslovakia. That's cool. Thank you guys for sharing. That's really neat to see. Okay, so within academic research and journalism, I think it's really important to consider the positionality of the people that are conducting research in rural spheres. So if they're not from that community, um, do they have a relationship with the people there or were they invited in by the community? Or are they really like spending the time to get to know um, those issues from a ground level view? Um, and something that's also I feel like lar left largely unrecognized that kind of can feed into um, the urban rural divide is embodied knowledge. Um, so because our understanding of a place comes from our lived experience of it um, and within these rural places where you're often, there's like a physicality to life there, I think embodied knowledge is really important. Um, so the ethnographer Dwight D. Conquergood described embodied knowledge, embodied knowledge as knowing how to do something and know, knowing who, so like knowing the people in the community versus knowing that and about, which is kind of more like something that you would study and maybe not like really know how to do um, physically. So just to read a quick quote from my thesis, um, the subjugation of embodied knowledge, uh, excuse me, I'll start over again. The subjugation of embodied knowledge by some academic circles, not all, and national news outlets is a threat to a more complex rural story. It is based on a bias toward dominant epistemologies that favor a white collar brand of intellectualism over knowledge which is embodied. So I wonder how the status quo would shift if the embodied knowledge needed to produce a crop of wheat or a red pepper for sale in a market was venerated as much as the intellectual knowledge needed to produce a work of academic literature. How could acknowledging embodied knowledge help to revive the rewrite the narrative on rural America? So in other words, I think that our idea of what intelligence is um, should be expanded. And also a side note, as a farmer's daughter, um, you need to know how, who, that, and about. You need to know the embodied knowledge and the intellectual knowledge when you are in that, um, that field, because it's understanding the soil, the animal, the global commodities market, the bank, the business. So it's not just embodied knowledge that's required in rural communities. It's really, it's really multifaceted. Okay, so then <laughs> intra-rural conflict. So when I first started reframing rural, I thought that it, it was really about bridging the urban-rural divide. And then the further I got into this project, I realized I was also creating it to address tensions um, that I've experienced in my home county. Um, so there's this really awesome book that I read called Dakota, A Spiritual Geography. And the author Kathleen Norris um, talks about the local history mentality 
um, which is really trying to revive a, a mythologized um, past of the pioneering forefathers. And I think that that's kind of the reason that um, Make America Great Again has, um, and Trump have kind of done well in some rural pockets is because they're, they're tapping into this, this local history mentality of trying to get back to the past and maybe not um, see what change we could make moving forward. So through reframing rural, I'm trying to crack that um, local history mentality open a little bit, dig deeper and provide a space for reflection. Um, and so on an, um, specific to Sheridan County, Montana, um, on an intra-rural divide level, I came across this really interesting article recently from the Great Plains Quarterly about the historical divisions of town versus country in my home county. And this stemmed from a socialist turned communist movement from 1918 to 1934, started by Scandinavian um, farm immigrants. There's some research that's been done on this time. And if, if you are ever curious to check it out, it's really fascinating stuff. But um, they talk about the geographical class divisions that defined townspeople or main streeters and rural folks as separate. Um, and this has had generational impacts. So for example, my oldest sister, Lori, when she went to kindergarten, the class was segre segregated by country kids and town kids. And then, um, you know, I've, I experienced this kind of cruelty as well from, from kind of town kids. And it was actually, it resulted in me switching high schools. Um, and so I, I ended up graduating from Williston, North Dakota. Um, and that was, that was a wonderful experience, but so there's a lot of there's a lot of divides that I think need to happen, uh, or excuse me, a lot of bridging that, that also needs to happen in these rural spaces, specifically at, in my home county. Um, so during the 20s, the, the, the reason why this movement kind of happened to the socialist movement during the 20s farmers were being exploited by banks and ele elevator companies grain elevator companies. And so they um, banded together, they studied the class struggle, and they, they actually founded the first co-op grain elevator in the county. And today my dad has contracts with and hauls grain to several co-op elevators that kind of followed suit um, in Montana and North Dakota. So um, I just want to read a quick quote that I got really jazzed about from this research. The Danes and Norwegians are by their very birthright inclined to be more socialistic since they have always favored a system of cooperation and a community spirit. So I also came across this research as I'm working on an episode, the next episode is going to be on the industrialization of agriculture, its effects on farm families, mental health and rural communities. Um, and I'll also talk about a bit about succession planning and the aging population in agriculture. So before we switch gears to talk about my creative process, I just wanna read a quick quote um, from Wendell Berry that is in, in conversation with some of these inequities the Scandinavian socialists were standing up against. If you can persuade farmers that their hardships are inevitable, then you've got them very securely trapped and they can be safely forgotten by their political representatives and exploited by agribusiness corporations. So that is the why I do what I do. And, and now I'd like to transition into a bit of the creative process. Um, so to launch into this next section, I'm going to sing you a song. Um, first create, um, my first creative love is music, more specifically um, singing. It's something that I can take with me if I'm you know, not at the farm. Like I, I really love country music actually. So that's, um, what I'm going to do, but I want to want to tell you a little bit about about this song. Um, I actually I thought Doc Watson had written it, but then I was kind of doing some research. And I, I, I'm kind of ha having a hard time finding who wrote it. I think it's just an old traditional. But um, so when I was young and in my prime, I left my home in Caroline. So I think about um, how rural youth are conditioned to leave their homes in order to make it in order to have a successful career, we're often taught that we need to leave. Um, so I think that first verse kind of ties into that. And then nostalgia is a source of inspiration. So Blue Ridge Mountain Blues. Uh, I also lived in North Carolina where the Blue Ridge Mountains are. Um, what else did I wanna say about this song before I um, jumped in? Oh yes, yeah, so 
the last verse. So I'm gonna do right by my walk. I'm gonna do right by my talk. So I think about this as like me losing my accent, but also kind of reclaiming my rural roots. And I just like how they're singing. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna stand up for for my culture and my tradition. Uh, so I'm gonna drink some water and I'm gonna play you the song. Thank you for letting me do that. <laughs> it's actually kind of hard to play the guitar when your hands are slightly shaking. Oh, that was great. Thank you for, for letting me do that. Okay. So I'm gonna jump back, jump back into this. So that is the song. I, I really recommend checking out the Doc Watson version. It's, it's very, very good. Um, okay. So um, in last week's artic, artist talk, Graham Murtaugh said that there are many different paths that one can take to become an artist. And I'm honestly still growing accustomed um, to thinking of myself as an artist, but I think it's important to just take a couple minutes to mention my journey in case um, you see yourself in it. So I came into my artistic practice via art administration and academia. And singing is my first and most intimate artistic passion. And I, I think I've probably been singing since I could talk. And uh, I really, really enjoyed that a lot. 
And then as I got older, my focus shifted into sports. In college, my focus honestly shifted to having a good time and I just kind of fell into creative nonfiction. Um, and then I wrote film, film reviews for a local blog after college in Missoula. And then I left Missoula for Portland, Oregon and had a really inspiring experience um, working for a documentary filmmaker, um, Ian McCluskey and the, uh, the documentary storytelling nonprofit that he founded called Northwest Documentary. Um, and there I helped um, orchestrate film festival tours for his doc feature. And then I, I first got into grant writing there. And then I moved to Asheville, North Carolina, and I worked at a PR and digital marketing firm there. And I was really missing the West and I was really missing the arts. Um, so we moved to Seattle so that I could go to SU. And um, I had a wonderful experience there. And I'm so glad to see people from SU um, coming here today. And so while I was in grad school, I worked at a nonprofit that served minority owned small businesses and small business owners. Um, and then I launched my business, Tree Ring Records, LLC, of which Reframing Rural is its first original work. Um, and then for the last 11 months, I've been self-employed writing grants for Italian-American immigrant choreographer, Lee Chegosti, um, contracting with Upward PR out of Missoula, Montana, founded by my sister, Lori Warden. And we've been working with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes on the Flathead Re Reservation recently to tell the stories of indigenous small business owners. Um, I'm developing a new small business idea in which I'll help um, families preserve their oral histories. And then of course I do the work of reframing rural. So I think that my career has been the inverse of many artists who earn a degree in their craft and then fi maybe figure out some of the fundraising marketing business pieces later. So I have a little bit more of that background. And now I'm really figuring out how to refine my craft, how to collaborate, how to present work. Um, for example, I'd, I'd love to find a home for some of the photography that you've seen, hopefully someday beyond the digital realm when we can gather together um, in person. So part of my creative practice based approach to auto ethnographic and ethnographic research and reframing rural. Um, it's not just the research that you heard earlier. Um, it's also interviewing and recording oral histories. Obviously, it's photography, it's experimenting with found objects and participating in the community. So I consider all of these elements as part of my um, creative practice. And um, one thing about the, the participation piece, and then I'm going to just show you some, some images. Um, I think it's really crucial for embodied knowledge to, for, me to come, for me to continue to go back and participate and be present in that community. Um, and then I also, when I have those experiences, I find it just so refreshing and really beautiful to connect with people through physical work. Um, to, to not just kind of be stuck in a chair talking about politics, but just to be doing work with people together. And I think that's something I really miss in, in an urban setting. So I'm going to just walk you through some pictures. So that's me this summer um, hauling the header of a combine during harvest because it was, yeah, the combine couldn't drive through the, this fence because it was too skinny. So we had to take, take it off and then put it back on. And that's me and my dad working on the combine header. And that's my cousin and my uncle and we're branding cattle. That's me in a choke cherry bush and my mom and I picked 80 pounds of choke cherries this summer and we made a bunch of choke cherry syrup and um, jelly. And then that's um, I'm processing chickens with my cousin's wife. And then I'm helping my cousin unload um, his semi with grain into the grain, um, you know, the grain bins at our house. He's right up there. That's my dog Birdie. And I was riding in the semi with my dad, taking a load of grain to the elevator. And those are my parents. I just wanted to sh shout out to my parents. And um, so now I kind of want to talk to you a little about a bit about my creative experiments. And I'm really just kind of gathering random things that I find and putting them together and, and seeing how they, how they work. Um, so this piece kind of just features some scrap metal that I found a couple of summers ago. I 
um, hauled away 15 tons of scrap metal and I pulled out um, some of my favorite pieces. But it was a really wonderful process. I got to help kind of clean up the yard around our house and um, experiment. This is a piece that's in my house that I pulled out. Um, I think it's the top of like an oil head. I forget exactly the piece, but I turned it into a planter. Um, there's scrap metal and bones all over my house. I really like to surround myself with these objects. Um, and then at that same time, I was experimenting with bones that, and so I kind of think of the bones as a representation of decay like the rusted metal. And also um, when I think about my hometown and how it's kind of dying, and I, I really don't like to use that term, but it's, it is um, a lot of, it's aging and there are a lot of people who have moved away. So it's, um, so that, that bone structure is kind of that representation of kind of decay. And then the sage and the wildflowers are um, a metaphor for the life and the color and the beauty that, that's still in that place. And then this summer, I kind of was ex experimenting on that same theme with um, bones and wildflowers again. And um, this piece is kind of cool. The, the actual case that the bones and wildflowers are sitting in um, was a traveling salesman case and it um, held different lubricating oil samples, which you can actually kind of see right down there. Um, and the, so he was just selling, I'm assuming it was a male selling these samples um, for you know trucks and tractors and different, different things. And so I kind of took the oil out and put in the flowers and the bones. Okay. And so that's just kind of some of my creative exper experiments and music and all the things that gets me inspired and thinking. And then um, I also want to touch on the nitty gritty process of making podcast episodes. Um, so I'm just going to kind of list off all of the things that happen before I publish um, an episode. So first I determine who to interview, then I do a pre-interview, which is basically a phone call with them. And I, um, from that initial phone call, I um, write my questions that I'm going to ask them and then I do further research and then I sit down and interview them. And then I also record different sound effects like a semi pulling into a driveway, rain, steak frying in a pan, a church service. Um, and then I listen to the recording very many times, but the first time I listen, um, I create kind of a rough transcription with timestamps. They're saying this at this time so that I can go back and edit it um, more easily. And then I, another time that I listen to it, I sketch out ideas. And so like here I have observations, major themes, concerns, um, tokenizing, misrepresenting, like different things that I, I wanna try not to do, um, different books and, and resources that I use, details, ideas, and then I write like my name and my relationship to that person. And because the, the episodes are part audio memoir, I'm thinking about how I'm in, in relationship with that person. And all of the people in the first season are people that I know um, personally, so. And then I edit, but I, um, I usually also kind of write the intro first and then all of this kind of stuff happens at the same time which is editing large chunks of audio, refining that into smaller sound bites, conducting additional research, writing other transitional narrative. Um, and then I'm kind of transcribing the dialogue verbatim that the other person is saying. So that um, when I'm done editing, it's kind of one neat transcript with my narration and their uh, dialogue. Um, and then I, I plug in filler music and then I send um, that rough cut to Andrew, my partner, and he, uh, and we talk about what I want the music to be like, the kind of mood and um, feeling. And then he records, um, he writes and records that music and then he sends it to me. And then we plug that in as like the, in the music in the interludes. And then I go back and then I record the narration. Um, and lately I've been doing that in a closet like many audio makers um, before I, I was taking advantage of um, the media lab at SU. But a closet works really well. I just throw a quilt over the top and buffers the sound pretty pretty well. Um, then I do more editing, more listening. I use I send it to somebody else to listen to. 
so that I get another opinion. And then um, the final step is I listen to it in my car because um, my car has the best speakers that I have. So um, I listen for, for how, you know, is the volume okay? And like, what kind of final edits do I, do I need? And in the future, I would like to um, send it to somebody to mix and master, but these yellow lines that you see on this image are me like tweaking the volume. Um, so I've been kind of doing that DIY um, for the first few episodes. And then um, I wanted to talk to you a bit about creating the theme music. Um, this was a really fun day. So uh, Andrew and our two friends um, got together and I just, I pointed, I, I taped up pictures on the wall and I would like point to an image and I'd say, let's create a soundscape based on that image. Or I would kind of create an idea like, what, what does it sound like when you're a child and the sun's going down and your mom's calling you in to, for dinner time. And so like, how can you convey that melancholy moment of childhood? And so it was a super fun. We just um, made music all day. And, and um, so they played all the stringed instruments and then, um, that I sang on top of the final song, which came, uh, which ended up being the theme music. And I think um, I wrote about this in my thesis. But if you if you listen to my voice, I feel like that that's how I feel about um, about home is when I'm singing the theme music because it's the simultaneous um, re release and freedom, but also there's like a bit of pain in in my voice. And I think we all kind of have that relationship with where we're from. Um, so that was really really fun to put together. And then, so after I have the episode all, episodes all edited together, I publish them and distribute them on SoundCloud and on Lisbon, which is a hosting platform that distributes a podcast to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all the other platforms. Um, and then I add the episode to my website. I plug in the transcript. I do the marketing. Like I usually write a personal intro in my newsletter and then I publish it on Facebook and Instagram. And sometimes I pitch um, news outlets on the episode. And then along this whole process, I have to make many, many decisions, including decisions about representation. So there are definitely things that I have left out of the podcast because I feel like it would um, not be potentially good for that person who's in the community um, or it, maybe I don't have um, share the exact belief views as that person. So I don't want to incorporate all of all of that. But I really am trying to to fully capture um, who the person is. And I, I, I think about the ethics of storytelling and also the position of power that you have as a producer. Um, so I'm really striving for accuracy, transparency. I want to acknowledge that power dynamic, respect the dignity and agency of the people whose stories I'm um, gifted, I'm, you know, unable to, they've gifted me their stories. So I really want to respect that and, and sh share that with respect. And then I'm also respecting the audience's intelligence. So those are some things that I'm kind of thinking about as I'm editing and, um, and representing these stories. Okay. So let me see where we're at with time. Okay. So I would like to, um, now we're gonna move into the what of my project and sharing the episodes. So as Peter mentioned, Reframing Rural's mission is to cultivate curiosity and conversation across the urban rural divide. So I'm still figuring out how to deliver on the conversation piece of my mission. Um, if COVID had not have happened, I would have had Reframing Rural audio visual exhibits, um, one in Seattle, and then I would have got, uh, traveled across Montana for a week and brought these pop-up art exhibits to small towns and cities. Um, so I really want to get folks talking to one another, especially if they're on either sides of the divide. Um, so I'm kind of wanting to try a little bit of a, an experiment here with you all. Um, so for before for the time until we have before the q and I'd like to share a couple of um, episode snippets with you. Um, I'll introduce the episode and then I'll share the clip. And as you're listening, if you, um, I welcome you to share any observations or questions that you have in the chat. Um, and then I thought we could just talk about it a little bit. I'm not exactly sure how, how it'll go, but um, I'll just play the clip and then feel free to, to chat out any observations or questions. So thank you for taking part in this experiment. 
Okay, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about Kim Redding in, um, who's featured in this first episode first. So a few things to know, she's really active in the Dagmar community. She leads church services, um, which uh, the church is one of two public places in town where people can gather. Um, she's on the store, uh, she's on the board of the Dagmar store. She's a leader in 4-H, FFA, and she's a volunteer EMT. So before, uh, so excuse me, Kim left Dagmar and she was able to move back six or seven years ago because of a job in the oil and gas industry. So through the making of her episode, I realized that issues are rarely as black and white as they first appear, specifically um, like within the oil industry, it is both environmentally destructive, but it's also reviving the town and enabling people to move back home. So at this point in the episode that I'm going to share with you, Kim is talking about her role as an environmental compliance officer and how through her role, she has to navigate um, relationships with people who either don't want any regulation of fossil fuels or um, people who want to stop using fossil fuels completely. So if I were to have a question for you to consider, it would be, how do you weigh the benefits versus the harm of the industry that's simultaneously harming the environment and revitalizing the rapidly shrinking uh, small towns and communities in the Mondak region? So I'm going to share just a couple minutes of this with you. 1608. Impact that we're gonna impact that we're gonna have. The more I speak to people for reframing rural, the more I'm convinced that things are rarely as black and white as they first appear. It's easy to write off an entire industry as bad, but then what about the work that Kim is doing? Breaking down stereotypes about people, places, and industries not fully represented in the larger cultural narrative is at the heart of reframing rural's mission. And storytelling is a tool that this podcast uses to embrace the value in understanding other people's viewpoints. Kim tells us how she navigates this in her work. So you've got a group of people who are very anti-industry um, and all that, and then you've got the group who are like so for it they can't see the forest through the trees, and they can't see the effect that they might be having. So you're going to have people who don't want to have any regulation. Mm-hmm. You're going to want to have people who want to regulate everything. And then I, my role is to be in the middle. I mean, my company still wants to make money, mm-hmm. but you also have to understand everyone else's belief system. So you have people who don't want you to use these at all and people who are gung-ho about using every fossil fuel possible. And so you have to have a good perception for everybody and, and be seen to be doing the right thing. That's the only way you're going to make money. And money right now is what runs the world, mm-hmm. right? So that's that's the industry that I'm in. So my goal is to just do everything as right as possible and making sure that we have as least impact as we possibly can while still running the business. I love how Kim's example highlights how necessary it is to try and understand other people's belief systems. Back to the Sunday service I attended on a hot morning last July, Kim's husband Aaron eloquently highlighted in a sermon about the Good Samaritan how important it is to show everyone compassion. So I'm curious if anyone, um, if they, if if there's anything that comes up for anyone while you're while you've listened to that clip um and if you if you have any questions or if you have any um just thoughts that you that you want to share feel free to um i guess you could even chime in and unmute yourself too money runs the world yeah i guess for me it just kind of calls to mind um how in rural areas like that kind of delicate walking the line and social interactions can seem even more important because you are a part of that community and everybody knows everybody and can talk about it so you have to be very consistent with your behavior you can't just tell one person one thing and a different person another thing just to you know be fine and get your job done you have to be consistent and act with integrity and be able to manage how that information about you gets disseminated in your community. I love that thought. It brings me back to um, when I was younger and just really wanted to be anonymous and that kind of desire to leave and, and just be 
a person in, in the city and, and not have to have to think about how I was being represented and, and what people knew about me. But I, I love how that does call to mind to the integrity and the consistency that you that you have to convey about your character. Thank you, Natalie. I, I really like um, your standpoint on it because it resonates a lot with me too. Um, I grew up in Walla Walla uh, and the first thing I wanted to do was like get out of the small town where I know everybody, right? And then now as I've like gotten older, married, we have our first kid on the way, it's like, well, actually I miss that community of like everybody looking out for each other. And I think that you um, highlighting that through other people's experiences really brings to like the forefront of how fruitful living in a small community can be. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. That was really great. Um, I love that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's something that I miss living in an urban area too is, um, is just not being able to gather together to brand cows or um, to herd cows or just these different things that we get together. Um, and you know, not even within the agricultural aspects, but just within the, within the community. Thank you, Benjamin. Yeah, I like that. It's the upside, close community, the downside, close community, <laughs> definitely. Wonderful. Okay, well, I'm gonna share um, the next snippet and unless there's anyone who has any final thoughts, feel free to, to jump in really quick. Cool. So um, this is Eddie Henches. Eddie and I went together, uh, went to high school together in Williston, North Dakota. He now teaches history in Fargo. Um, in, the, in this episode, we, um, episode three, we discuss in depth about his time teaching American history through an indigenous lens on the Fort Peck reservation. Um, and I'm going to share with you this, at this point in the episode, Eddie and I are kind of thinking about like how rural and urban communities can work together. So perhaps after we share this clip, we can kind of have a group envisioning exercise and, and just think about envision how rural and urban can, can work and collaborate together better. Is there anything that you would want people outside of the Mondak region to know about the area? Like what, do you, what, what do you care about people knowing about this region? So in Max Ehrman's poem, Desiderata, it starts with, go placidly amid the noise and haste, and don't forget what peace there may be in silence. And I think that that's a really, really good way to think about the urban-rural divide, with the silence and being close to nature and the strength that you have to have, the hardiness, the self-sufficiency of the country. It, it takes a lot of hard work and planning to live in a rural area like that. But a lot of people get it because they've been there for so long and they've watched their family do it over and over. And I think that's just a really important thing that, that could bridge the urban rural divide. Because like you said before, there's so many talks of politics and all these divisive different things, but I think that there's a lot of grit that rural people have that urban people could really dig. And I think that there's a lot of more exposure to different things that really would benefit the rural area. Yeah. But I think that the peace and contentedness in being in such a vast, immersive landscape is really good for people in the city to see, too. You feel it thin out. You feel mm -hmm. everything stretch. And you just have to make peace with that. It just humbles you to have to slow down and take it as it goes. So with all, all of the wealth of information and diversity and access that urbanites have, that can benefit the rural area. And I think that the absolute, the slowing down of the pace and being able to process that information could really help mm. the urban population. I've never so yes, um, is there any, any other thoughts about, about this episode, about Eddie? Um, I just, I love hearing him start with, with a poem, with Max, Max Ehrman's poem and, and really beautifully convey um, how 
the rural can kind of more digest some of the proliferation of information that comes out of um, urban spaces. Yeah, I liked how we talked about, you know, how you in a rural area, you might have a closer relationship with nature and how you need to slow down and process things and you kind of have um, that space or that peace. And, you know, because of that relationship with nature, you might notice consequences from human behaviors differently than you would in an urban area. Like, you know, if you're out in Nebraska, something that I've noticed is, you know, you used to have a big field of grass full of fireflies. And now with um, a higher prevalence of pesticide use, they've like disappeared. So it's just a very stark imagery there of the change that has happened that we have caused. But if you were in a city, maybe you wouldn't be seeing the little fireflies anyway. Thank you, Natalie. That's that's a really important observation. Yeah, I think maybe in the city we see cranes, but like you said, the fireflies or the coyotes might, well, I guess I have seen a coyote in a neighboring park here, but some of the other um, wildlife wouldn't really be here anyways um, at this point in our urbanization of this space. Um, Reciprocity and exchange and connection. That's great, yeah. Wonderful. Well, if there are any um, closing thoughts about this episode, feel free to chime in. Otherwise, I just thought um, that we would move into the Q&A section. And here's my contact info. If you ever wanna reach out, please, please feel free to do so. <laughs>